Welcome, everyone. Uh, and uh, we're very pleased to have you join us on this, uh, on this journey. Uh, the, uh, I'm, go I'm Charlie Washburn. I'm, I'm uh, vice president at Seven Hills Foundation and uh, the chief operating officer for the time being, anyway, of uh, uh, VSA Massachusetts. And I'm the one who's persuaded a lot of the uh, that pers uh, I'm the one who kind of got uh, my friends from the uh, from Bach and Leslie to to play in this sandbox with me, uh, but well, I will, I'll be speaking more at another point. But right now, I'd like to uh, introduce. Uh, I'd like to to welcome. Uh, ask uh, the uh, Mateus, who's the uh, president and uh, of the and director of the uh, museum, to welcome us and get us started. If you would please, Mateus. I think I can welcome you. You don't need me to get started, but I'll do my very best. Um, so, um, well, first of all, uh, we have a new mission statement, which I would like to recite in front of you. So the Worcester Art Museum um, connects people, uh, cultures, and communities through the experience of art. What you are doing, uh, and what this is about, is empowering people through the experience of art and connecting people. So already, uh, VSA's uh, um, activity and that of the Worcester Art Museum are very closely aligned. And I'm extremely proud uh, that um, Bill and his, uh, his organization were able to attract you all to this museum. We should do much, much more of this, and we will uh, moving forward. I would encourage you, uh, as this is also very much about art, uh, to go uh, and have a look at the, if you haven't already, at the wonderful exhibition uh, that uh, VSA has organized downstairs. And should you still have a little bit of time, maybe also hop into our galleries. There's also quite some empowerment waiting for you. Uh, in particular, our contemporary uh, exhibition of CJ Huang, uh, uh, Reusable Universes, which is uh, an absolute delight, and uh, you can, whilst you're looking at these funny creatures that are blowing and retracting, think about the empowerment part if you're so inclined. So I wish you the best of success for this uh, meeting. I hope and I'm sure that a lot of good things are coming out of this and I very much hope that uh, uh, an equal amount of good things will be coming out of this for the Worcester Art Museum and for the social glue that we hope to provide for this community. Thank you very much. So Matthias, uh, just before you go, I, I just wanted to mention something. I was sitting here before uh, we opened and I met Suzanne. Um, and she was saying, uh, you know, this is uh, incredible, uh, you know, to have a museum um, that is connecting with the community this way. And she said something that really resonated with me and it was the house that I thought I knew. Um, and so thank you, Matthias, for opening up um, this beloved house that is such a community partner and Susan's sentiments are exactly what today is about. Um, opening up this house so that you can get to know it better because this is one of the true gems, not just in Central Mass, but in the entire Commonwealth. Um, so thank you and thank you, Matthias. Um, I'm Kathy Jordan. I'm the CEO at Seven Hills Foundation and I am delighted um, that you're here today to participate with us in um, Arts in the Brain. This has been um, a project that's been a long time in development. Um, it brings together um, those pieces that are so important to us and that is full community inclusion, different ways of expression, um, and how each of us um, communicate within those communities. So thank you for participating um, with us today in that. Um, I really wanted to thank uh, Worcester Art Museum, WAM, uh, for their hospitality and their partnership. Um, in particular, um, with the Open Door Gallery um, in partnership with VSA Massachusetts. One of the hallmarks of this year has been the Creative Minds Program, and I really encourage all of you um, to participate and to get more information um, about that. 
funded largely by the Massachusetts Rehab Commission um, and the statewide uh, head injury program through a grant to Seven Hills Family Services um, and Leslie Courtney, um, our VP of Family Services is here today so you can talk to her more about that if you'd like to. Uh, we've crafted a series of arts activities that put the museum's collection and educational resources to work um, for people of all abilities. I want to thank Charlie Washburn who is um, in his swan song after 30 years as the CEO of BSA Massachusetts. He's not leaving us completely, but he is going to get a little more free time, uh, and he's not going to have to worry about P&Ls and everything else as, as much. Um, but I really want to thank uh, Charlie as well as his team, including Nicole Argois Hurel, um, who is the new managing director. She's the new Charlie. Um, thank you, Nicole. and all the people from Leslie University and Bach, the Boston Arts Consortium for Health. Um, their tireless efforts to design and organize this symposium have created for us a remarkable opportunity for families and caregivers. Um, so if those uh, folks who I've just mentioned could stand just for a moment so we can recognize you, uh, please do so. Thank you. Um, I know you're going to have an amazing day. You're going to have great discussions, uh, tremendous artwork, uh, and uh, uh, expressions are going to come um, uh, through today, and we can't wait to see what's being created. Um, I'd now like to invite Dr. Lisa Wong, one of the driving forces behind Bach, uh, to come up and introduce our first guest, Dr. Ronald Hirschberg. Um, and Dr. Wong has also been a friend of um, Seven Hills, and in particular, the uh, Pediatric Center um, through her work with Longwood Symphony. Um, so she's a, uh, a longtime advocate for what we do, and we're delighted to have uh, yet another opportunity to collaborate with Dr. Wong. Dr. Wong? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is a really exciting day for all of us because we who are living in the world of how to make people better in, in different ways have, have found that the arts are something that empowers all of us, um, helps us to find our own central way of healing, but also a, a way that we can bring communities together through, it, through different varieties of things, dance, um, visual art, music, and so we're so happy that all of you are here. I'm sure that many of you are already artists and we want to hear your stories as the day goes by. So the way uh, the day is, is planned, we have um, some lectures from wonderful people to, in the morning, John Sarkin, the artist, and Ron Hirschberg, who I'll talk about in a second. But in the afternoon, we're inviting you to find your own way of expression. Um, and hopefully take away with you some new strategies and new techniques that you can share with your family and your colleagues. So uh, it should be a very, very exciting day. I want to really thank Charlie Washburn for his, his vision. And um, we've been working on this project for quite a while. And each meeting has been just so much fun, just clouds and clouds of brainstorming and, and energy. And then now, today's the day that it's all really coming together. Um, so enjoy yourself today. Share with us what your experiences are. Enjoy this incredibly wonderful um, home away from home, this museum that has so many interesting and, and uh, exciting ways to invite the public in, rather than being sort of the, the ivory tower. And um, so that, that should be the day. I just wanted to say a word about Boston Arts, Arts Consortium for Health. So in Boston, we realize that at Leslie University, there are wonderful expressive arts therapists, art therapists, music therapists. At Berkeley College of Music, there are music therapists. At Mass General, there are people like me who are pediatricians who play music. Um, and across the whole city, in different ways, there are people 
coming from conservatory, trying to find ways to heal, people coming from the, from the hospitals, uh, trying to find ways to use their art, people from the museums trying to find ways to connect. And so we started a consortium of all of us because we knew that we, finding different ways to talk about arts and healing would bring us all together. And it's, it's, it, it fits in with arts and the brain because we're, we have created our own neural network uh, there. And so we're all just little nodes of information bringing it together. And I'm so excited that this is also happening here in Worcester. And it, uh, if we can do this across the country, wouldn't we be a much better place? Um, but I want to introduce uh, Dr. Ronald Hirschberg. Um, he being one of these amazing, remarkable people, he is a physician, a rehabil rehabilitation doctor, and a musician. And what I find most uh, exciting about Ron, and he's going to talk about his own story um, in just a little while, but what's really exciting about him is he finds excitement in everything that he, he, he does and he sees. And when he, his powers of observation in a patient, he, he sort of exudes the empathy that we all want in our doctors. Um, so I think you're going to enjoy this, uh, the next 45 minutes that he's going to be giving a talk. So I'd like to welcome Ron Hirschberg to the stage. Here, Lisa. Thank you so much for that wonderful intro. And meeting Lisa a, a few years ago at NEMCOG um, at the uh, at, at Harvard uh, during a uh, amazing uh, symposium. Um, Lisa's told this story before, but we uh, we met for the first time, and I've heard so much about her amazing work and what she's done for arts and the community and music and and medicine in Boston, and, and it was great to finally meet her. And she said, oh, uh, um, it's nice to meet you too. Thanks for talking today. Um, what are you doing in August? Would you like to go to Lithuania? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and you know, that, that's not the kind of thing you hear all the time. And uh, so I said, sure, well, I, I will check with my wife, but it uh, sounds great. And so I think it's a little loud. I was going to turn it down a little. Is that me, or should someone else turn it down? I'll just bring this down lower. How's that? It's not, it's not that loud back here. Okay. It's okay. Actually quite good back here. Okay. Good. Good. Um, so thank you, Lisa. We 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 went we went to Lithuania together, and it wasn't just Lisa, Lisa and I, but we had a group, and she 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 brought um, a, a culmination of, of musicians and and, uh, and lectures, and and we we spoke in a music therapy uh, department there, and it was a really fascinating experience of culture and, and music, and I. And anyway, it really triggered more of an interest uh, in, in my own in, in bringing, uh, uh, bringing uh, neuro rehab and neuroscience together with music and, and the arts. Um, and, but thank you, uh, Wham, uh, the Worcester Arts, and, and thank you, uh, uh, Charlie and, and, and Kate and others for, uh, at Seven Hills for bringing this all together. It's an amazing day. So, I think Charlie needs another round of applause. So I wanted to start uh, briefly with, with a patient named Patrick. And Patrick was, uh, is an amazing guy who, in his mid-20s, was getting his MFA at uh, University of New Hampshire. And he's also an avid cyclist, and, and he uh, was a poet as well. And Patrick was, was going through an intersection in, uh, in Durham, uh, New Hampshire in 2010. And there was a, uh, an oncoming car uh, that came across and hit Patrick. And Patrick um, uh, was, was lunged into the air. And he had a, uh, a severe injury, a severe traumatic brain injury. And I met Patrick when he was in a coma at two, two weeks into this. Um, and Patrick, uh, the story is going to end well, by the way. I just want everybody to know that. Uh, Patrick. Uh, had an incredible recovery over a few months. And I followed and worked with him and his family and, and the therapist over two months in Spalding Rehab. Uh, Patrick, two years later, is sitting here uh, getting back into poetry. And what Patrick did just a few years ago was he came out with this book called Towards Being Infinite. And anybody know what the acronym Towards Being Infinite is? Yeah. 
TBI, right. And this is Patrick's pen name, and you can look him up uh, on Amazon. Uh, this is an incredible book of poems that he put together. And he was always a poet, but his poetry was further inspired and frankly made even more amazing three years later after this experience. I say that because with art, with music, with poetry, they go together, and this crowd, I think, really knows that. Uh, an, another couple years later, he actually was, uh, anybody know this book? Uh, he, he was instrumental in coaching three people that got their essays published in Chicken Soup for the Soul with, for Traumatic Brain Injury. So he not, not only was an amazing, is an amazing poet, but he was a teacher as well. So back to Dr. Wong, I have to thank her for this uh, uh, enlightenment. enlightenment. Um, she, um, she spoke once about uh, Dr. Bill Roth, who, Bill Roth was actually a surgeon in the 1800s, and he, uh, I remember the Bill Roth procedure in medical school, was a, as a, he's a surgeon, and uh, he was also a musician. And his parents, uh, uh, you know, were very supportive of uh, Theo, I, I don't know if what they called him, uh, but they said, well, uh, you can go into medical school, uh, but you're not going into music, something like that. I, I've, I've heard those uh, things before in, in our training. Uh, so anyway, they encouraged him to go to medical school. But he was one of the first people to actually write on the connections between music and medicine in a scientific way in the 1800s. So none of this is new, as we all know. Um, he wrote, it is one of the superficialities of our time to see in science and in art two opposites and then imagination is the mother of both. And that's in the 1800s. Who knows this guy? So Oliver Sacks, who's a, neuro, a neuroscientist and neurologist who we sadly lost last year, um, he uh, was prolific in the 80s in working with music and medicine, music and in, in, uh, uh, awakenings of, of uh, people with, with, with brain injury, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. He wrote, music can lift us out of depression or move us to tears. It is a remedy, a tonic, an orange juice for the ear. But for many my neurological patients, for many of my neurological patients, music is even more. It can provide access, even when no medication can, to movement, to speech, to life. For them, music is not a luxury, but a necessity. We have functional MRI machines, we have EEGs, we have ways of proving that music and art we think work. But the fact of the matter is, we all know in this room and in other circles that it helps. Art therapy won't eliminate the illness, but it can stimulate the brain in a new direction. The creativity and happiness that art brings can make all the difference in the life of a loved one who's been progressively in decline, and that's someone that has Alzheimer's. But when it comes to 2017, uh, we give labels to things and we, we want to study more about neuroscience in the brain and we have the tools to do it. So we want to make fancy diagrams and show that music in fact and art in fact stimulates the brain. What's neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity is happening to everyone. We used to think it was only in kids. But then we realized in the 1960s that neuroplasticity and neural repair actually was something that was an adult phenomenon as well. Coined initially, not coined, but brought to light by William James, a psychologist in 1890, organic matter, especially nervous tissue, seems endowed with a very extraordinary degree of plasticity. There, there are a few different types of plasticity, of brain repair, essentially the kind of repair where there's injury and repair to that tissue happens directly to those neurons, those damaged cells in the brain injury, let's say, or in the stroke. And then there's a type of neuroplasticity where the good brain, or the brain that's not injured, most of the brain, steps to the plate, so to speak, and does the function for that injured brain. How does neural rehab work? Again, 2017, we think we know something, but we're still working on it. Is it a feedback loop, motor rehearsal, cortical reorganization? Is it neurotransmitters? Are there neurotransmitters that help rehab? Is it environmental enrichment and exercise? Is it a combination of all of that? This is the frontal lobe of a brain from a brain injury. Here's a spinal cord injury. 
and this is a stroke. The impairment is essentially the part of the brain or the spinal cord, cortical or deep, surface or deep, that is injured. The ability for us to recover that is through time, through rehabilitation, through exercise, through medication, and through family, right, support. It's, it's a very complex wheel of recovery. But there's something about music and art that I feel and many feel are part of that spokes of the wheel. So just a little bit on neuroplasticity and repair, the reason why we do rehab. Well, in, in general, neuroplasticity is something that we know occurs in the cortices of our brain. But we still don't know the types of rehab, the timing of rehab, how we do rehab. There's still so, uh, so many unanswered questions. But however, we do know is that environmental enrichment, so giving stimuli to little rats in a cage, little mice in a cage, We'll talk about that a little later, too, where animal studies have shown that when you enrich their lives versus not in a cage, you see that their brain weights increase, you see that their nerve growth factors increase, and even the volume of their cortex is increased with environmental enrichment. So if we start to think about what are the ways we enrich our brain. So but rehab's complex. Um, uh, at the end of the day, no one's built the same way. And the fact of the matter is, is that what you bring to the injury usually is very important in how you recover, okay? I like to say we were related, but I don't think we are. And what happens after rehab is very important, of course. How you rehab, what happens, many factors. And then, of course, is the black box of rehab. When you're in the acute, anybody work in hospital systems in acute care? So there's that black box of rehab. Well, we're sending them to rehab. Good luck. And people talk about that black box. I think we know more now than we did before. The impairment is what I talked about before. This happens to be MS plaques, multiple scler sclerosis. The functional limitation is the ability of that person to walk or take steps. The disability is that person's ability to get to this museum today, to work, to school. That's what impacts for disability. That's how you function in society. This is all the new WHO criteria. So the question is, does music and arts impact here? Or does it impact here? I think many of us would argue it's a combination of both. This is an old study in 1982. I won't go over the details, but essentially, they looked at mice in a cage, OK? And they wanted to see how amphetamine, kind of like that Dunkin' Donuts we all had this morning, right? Versus just saline, so water, will affect a little mouse's recovery. And what you see here is that over time, over days to weeks, is duration. And this is how well they did on a balance beam, a little mice on a balance beam, OK? And so the saline mice did this well, OK? That was a, kind of a regular recovery. The amphetamine mice, the Dunkin' Donuts mice, OK, did a lot faster slope of recovery, and they did better in the end, OK? Now, when you put them in a, in a restraint, OK, I don't think the animal rights will like this, but you put them in restraint. Look what happens. They do the same. The bottom line is that if you give them enrichment and if you give them some form of dopamine or stimuli, we'll talk about that in a minute, the combination can, we think, can help in recovery. And that's what a lot of this is based on in neural recovery. So this is more of a fancy cartoon of all of the different pathways that go in the brain. Music and arts affect dopamine. 5-HT is serotonin, norepinephrine. These are neurostimulants and dopaminergic ingrained in the, in, the, in, the, in the brain, in the bloodstream, that give us arousal, give us attention, help with our memory. And it's throughout the brain. 
I wanted to shift a little bit to music itself. There are certain areas of the brain that are studied more than others in music. And there's very interesting data on, uh, in the last 10, 15 years, about how music impacts the brain. There's something in the temporal and the frontal lobe called the arcuate fasciculus. It's very fun to say fast, if anyone wants to do it. And so this is a sound perception and production highway, basically, okay? This is the left side of your temporal lobe into your frontal lobe. This is what makes us talk and communicate. And we know that it's shaped by experience. Music comes in through the brainstem from the ear into the temporal lobe. We hear it, we understand it, and then we can sing and process it as it comes out of our frontal lobe, on the lower part of our frontal lobe. Music crosses the corpus callosum, okay? Corpus callosum is basically a, a fiber-dense highway between both hemispheres of the brain, the left and the brain connect. Now, I put this funny looking guy up here. He's called a homunculus, okay? And so what that is is a depiction of this is a, this is a cross section of all of, the, all of the gyri in the brain, the white and gray matter that come right up to this area, the motor cortex, okay? The reason why this guy has large ears and li large hands is because it's the amount of neurons that are dedicated to that area right here. So that makes sense, and we're going to see later with Mr. Sarkin, we're going to see some, and others, we're going to see some demonstrations why the ears and the hands are very important in music. I look at the deep, deep in the brain as the rhythm section of the brain. The basal ganglia, the cerebellum, and the motor cortex up here, they're all involved in beat processing. There are people that actually are doing many papers and lectures on sensing the beat, which is very important for Parkinson's, stroke, and other areas of brain injury as we learn how to neuro rehab. Gottfried Schlag uh, is a, a wonderful neurologist and organist uh, that is, uh, since the, I think, mid-80s, has been studying music in the brain. Uh, and he's done amazing work uh, along with Nina Krauss, who is in Chicago. Uh, from an audiology perspective, uh, she's a neuroscientist. Essentially, people have looked at the fact that if you have children that train with music versus not, you have data that shows that their vocabulary, fine motor, and reasoning skills improve with the ones that had music training. We like to, th we like to think that, we, it's part of us, we, we think these things, but we don't know until we study it. Neur in the neonatal ICU, Music has been shown to increase with feeding and preemies, increase in growth, sleep, decrease energy expenditure and stress and pain, and levels of cortisol that are in the blood that cause stress or that are evoked by stress. Gottfried Schlag in 95 short showed that that corpus callosum, remember this guy, right, is larger in children that learn musical instruments before the age of seven versus after the age of seven. There was a follow-up study that showed that the white matter tracts in the corpus callosum and other areas are larger the younger you are with the music training, the younger you started training. That does not mean start your kid at age one. We had, with my 12-year-old my who had piano lessons at three, it didn't go well. Um, so. It's all, it's all a psychosocial experiment. Uh, now, Sarkomo is a, is, is a, I'm forgetting his first name, but he's in Finland, and he studies stroke patients. And they, they looked at 60 stroke patients. They did an hour of music training or stories or, and, and no additional therapy to PT and OT over six months. The music group improved with their verbal memory, their attention, and their mood over the other two groups. They took the same groups, same patients, and they looked at their MRI. And they found that their left-sided superior frontal gyrus, who I point out, pointed out before with the arcuate fasciculus, and their limbic structures deep in the brain were more robust than the others. Neurological music therapy has been around for almost 20 years or so. My colleague, Brian Harris, is going to be here later, who's a certified uh, NMT. 
And it, it's a wonderful field that's growing, uh, and there are programs all over the country right now. Uh, it's a therapeutic application of music for cognitive, sensory, motor dysfunctions that come from neurological diseases. This is what the, sort of the essence, I think, of NMT. It's based on stimulating music perception and production, parts in the brain, and the effects thereof on non-musical behavioral functions. We all love music. We think music can help us. But the point of NMT is to target attention and memory and gait and language, the centers that impact the ability for us to do that in daily life. Rhythm and pitch, temporal music cues, different harmonies and polyphonic music, different beats and meter, all have their specific interventions in NMT. I put this here only because when you think about what they do, these parameters and these impairments or abilities live in these areas of the brain, different areas of the brain. Now, has it been studied? Michael Tout, who's in Colorado, no, he's in Toronto now. He's a father of NMT. Took 31 patients with brain injury, acquired brain injury, four sessions, 30 minutes each. They looked at attention, memory, executive, and emotional. 23 patients were the control. And in the NMT group, they showed increased executive function, decreased depression and anxiety, and in this particular study, no attention in, uh, improvements and memory improvements. Other, other folks have shown improvement in attention. I wanted to show this two-minute video of Peter, and this is my colleague, Brian Harris, who performed and is in, in a therapeutic session. And let's see if this works. We have no sound. Give us one second, Pete, thanks. I can actually do this on the level there. Yeah. One more thing. So, and this is showing melodic MIT, melodic intonation therapy. And this is studied by Dr. Gottfried Schlag and others that really looks at a stroke on the left side of the brain, that impairment in language. And the idea is to utilize the other side of the brain and cross those fibers through the corpus callosum back over to the injured fibers. And you're utilizing that. It's not, okay. How about just uh, on the computer itself? Can you take that out? Maybe it could come out of the little speakers. Or uh, in a second, it will be. Sorry. One 
example of the amazing work that uh, Brian and others do for patients with stroke. There is a uh, neuroscientist and saxophonist named Charles Lim. Dr. Lim's an amazing guy, and he's done some great work with language and music. And I'm just going to show you briefly these two scans. These are brains on top, slices of the brain like this, and slices like this. And the red and orange are activated, and the blue is deactivated. And what he did was he put a person inside a functional MRI scan with a keyboard that has no metal, so they were able to put it in the MRI, and he played jazz. And what they did was they played, they had two people playing jazz, one in the, one in the scanner and one outside. And one, one did, and the other one, exactly like that. And what he was able to do is prove that the language centers light up in jazz, and he's done it in hip hop as well. The language centers light up just the places that language and communication live. And when you read a scripted sonata, it may be beautiful, but the language centers don't light up. So music is a communication. I'm looking at the time, and I just want to make sure we're good. Wendy McGee uh, is a neuroscientist and a, and, and a music therapist, and she looked at 20 people with severe brain injury in the minimally conscious state and vegetative state early on. And they looked at EEG and behavioral responses. They used live music that was preferred, and white noise, and disliked music, and silence. They, they looked at all of these parameters in patients. When they showed the patients live and preferred music, the EEG went crazy in the space it's supposed to go crazy, okay? I don't read EEGs. I don't know if anybody else does here. But trust me to say that's where it, where it was active. The blink response was also behaviorally salient when the people in the low conscious state were able to hear music. So this is a very small study, only 20 patients. Um, but there's, so there's a lot more to be done. Neurodegenerative rehabilitation is actually, I think, a whole subset of rehabilitation. And there's Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis uh, people, people with these diseases that get improvement from music in the arts. It's not always a downward slope. There's a way to attenuate that slope and a way to help their quality of life. Back to the rats, okay? So, what this study essentially did was they killed off all of the dopamine in these poor rats, okay? Over 95% uh, of it. And then they used environmental enrichment. This is basically Vegas for rats, okay? <laughs> all right? Or maybe the, art, the Worcester Art Museum, okay? And then uh, they took these poor rats that were, had no stimulation, okay? And they showed that after the, the, the rats that had environmental Enrichment, only 55% of their dopamine was lost. So they improved their dopamine. And they had brain-derived uh, neurotropic factors, basically uh, uh, brain-secreted uh, neuro neurotropic growth factors were improved in the ones with the environmental en enrichment. Four minutes. Music and the beat and rhythm bypass certain areas of the brain that create our ability to walk. And so the cues that you may see, and we're going to work on this later with Brian, this schematic shows that some of the external cues of music actually do what the internal cues are less able to do with traumatic brain injury, with stroke, and with Parkinson's. They step to the plate. Dance, an emerging, 
amazing thing for Parkinson's, but also for other uh, uh, impairments as well. There was a study in the New England Journal that looked at almost 500 patients over 21 years. And they looked at all of their physical activity. They looked at tennis and golf and swimming. They looked at reading and music and dance. And they found that looking back in a retrospective study, that dance actually showed the most improvement, or I, say, I should say the lowest risk for dementia, for going into memory loss, dementia, and Alzheimer's. Does that mean it's for everybody? No. But it shows you that it involves all of the sensory input. It involves music. It involves social. There are studies that have shown this as well. And I'm breezing through just for time, sorry. People have shown that art is very therapeutic, just like for Patrick, who's an artist and a poet that I talked about before. This is a TBI survivor using art for quality of life and to help with anxiety. <laughs> this is a post 9-11 veteran who works with masks. TBI and PTSD go hand in hand. You've heard a lot about this. I like this quote a lot. I thought this was a joke, recall, re recalled Staff Sergeant Perry Hopman, who served as a flight medic in Iraq. I want no part of it because, number one, I'm a man, and I don't like holding a dainty little paintbrush. Number two, I'm not an artist. And number three, I'm not in kindergarten. Well, I was ignorant, and I was wrong because it's great. I think this is what started me kind of opening up and talking about stuff and actually trying to get better. So it goes on. I don't have the website for you, I'm sorry, but there's beautiful artwork that has healed many veterans and many TBI survivors. This is William Budermolen, who's a German descent. He's, a, he's an American guy who um, uh, is a, uh, was a famous artist. And he uh, depicted himself in self-portraits over about four years with Alzheimer's. And you see, over time, what changes. But what he always said, even at this stage, was that he was able to talk about his artwork and talk about others that were connected to that artwork and people he knew, just like we do with music. Mary Hecht is a renowned sculpture. The same thing happened for her. Her doctor said, we were amazed. What's more, when drawing, Hecht would speak eloquently about her art. And this was someone with a mini mental uh, status state of 10 out of, uh, out of 30, which is very profoundly demented. It happens in music. I have a five or a three minute video. Three is good. This is, the, this is the end of the talk, but um, this to me really says so much, and I'm going to have uh, pay homage to Dr. Sachs, who, if you haven't seen this, I'm going to go up to minute two. I have one right there. Two. Unresponsive and almost unalive. Henry. Yeah. Henry. Yes, sir. I found your Sorry. music. Uh, you, want, you want your music now? Well, not me. Okay. okay. Let's try your music, okay? And then you tell me if it's too loud or not. Then he is given an iPod containing, we know, his favorite music. <laughs> In mind, he doesn't know what his daughter's name is. He doesn't, he's not able to care for himself at all. He's completely dependent and he's not able to have a conversation. He, he lights up, his face assumes expression, his eyes open wide. He, uh, he starts to, um, to sing, to rock, and to move his arms. 
and he's being animated by the music. And he used to always sit on the unit with his head like this. He didn't really talk to much people. And then when I introduced the music to him, this is his, his reaction ever since. <laughs> called music the quickening art and Henry is being quickened he's being brought to life yeah I'm gonna take the music for one second okay just huh? to ask you a few questions okay Thank you. I'm gonna give it back to you uh -huh. okay the effect of this doesn't stop which when the, uh, the, the headphones are taken off uh, Henry, normally mute and virtually unable to answer the simplest yes or no questions is quite voluble Henry yeah um, uh, do you like the iPod? Do you like the music you're hearing? Yes. Tell me about your music. Well, I don't, I don't, don't, I don't have one, I mean. Do you like music? Yeah, I'm crazy about music. You play beautiful music, beautiful sound. Did beautiful. You, did you play music when you were, uh, were you, did you like music when you were young? Yes, yes, I went to big dances and things. What was your favorite music when you were young? Well, well I guess, uh, well, Cab Calloway was my number one band guy. I liked it. That is the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the What was your favorite, favorite Cab Calloway song? Oh, I'm the old of a Christmas. Planned on me with plenty of snow, mistletoe, present, red brand new tree. Ow! So, in some sense, Henry is restored to himself. He has uh, uh, remembered uh, who he is, and uh, he's he's reacquired his his identity for a while through the power of music. What, what does music do do to you? It gives me the feeling of love. No, no man, think right now the world needs to come into music, singing. You got beautiful music in, beautiful, oh lovely. And uh, I feel the band of love, the dream. The Lord came to me, made me holy. I'm a holy man, so He gave me this sound. So I just say, I meet you. Let me see, Rosalie, won't you love me, Rosalie, won't you be sweet and kind? With this beautiful new technology, you can have all the music which is significant for you in something as big as a matchbox or, or whatever. And I think this, this, this may be very, very important in uh, helping to animate, organize, uh, and uh, bring a sense of identity back to people who are who are out of it otherwise. Music will bring them back into it, into their own personhood, their own memories, their own autobiographies. So that's a documentary, um, Alive Inside. Um, so I wanted to end with that. It shows the power of music, but we, we can also extrapolate to some of the artwork we've seen uh, affect people and their, uh, and their loved ones with quality of life and bringing people to uh, who they are um, and not just what their disease is. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ron. It's, that was a very very good. It's a great way to start. Uh, we, we now have a, a, a break planned. Uh, as you can tell, we're kind of crowded in here. It's a good problem. Um, the, uh, let me mention there are uh, bathrooms. There's four here, two men's, two women's, uh, but they're all single seaters, so, uh, and they're marked, the two, two of them are wheelchair accessible. They are the only wheelchair accessible uh, bathrooms in, in, the, in the building. Anticipating that there's, there could be a crowd, uh, there are more bathrooms 
uh, downstairs uh, on the, uh, the corridor headed towards the uh, open door gallery. So we have about 15 minutes. Uh, don't go too far away because we're going to want to start, uh, we've got, got uh, a, a show planned uh, where you'll get to meet John. Uh, I want to just call your attention to Sherry Kennedy who is, uh, has started the uh, process of uh, graphic organizing our, uh, our experience today. Uh, so she'll be doing that and she's, uh, Marion Brown is around here someplace, she's helping out. Uh, and uh, I believe they're looking for volunteers to help with the uh, afternoon sessions. So if you're interested, uh, those are the two people to talk to. Uh, so we're gonna take a break. Uh, there was something else I needed to say. Um, but, yes? Um, well, for anybody who's interested in getting CEs, um, oh, yes. please make sure to sign up at the registration desk at the lunch time. It's just for licensed mental health counselors. Right, and so there's, there's the CEs, and there's also sign-up sheets at the registration table for uh, the, the various workshops. I know quite a few have done that already, but if you haven't, you want to get on a list. And uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. 